Nordic Talks. Uh, my name is Marvin Atkins. I'm one of the cardiac and vascular surgeons here at Houston Methodist. And this evening I'm uh, joined by one of my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Charu Bavari, who's one of our vascular surgeons here. Uh, Charu, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And uh, the title of our talk this evening is The Current Management of Endoleaks uh, Following Endovascular Repair of the Abdominal and Thoracic Aorta. Charu, thanks again for joining us. Marvin, thank you. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on the CV Live show. Thank you, Methodist uh, uh, DeBakey Heart Vascular Center and DeBakey Education. And most importantly, thank you, Marvin, for the invite and the opportunity to participate. Great. Thanks. We'd like to uh, invite our audience to participate as well. Uh, we have a couple couple ways for our audience members to uh, uh, connect with us and ask questions. Uh, one of those is via the web. Uh, if you go to pollev.com and type in the words uh, debakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, uh, you're able to log in and uh, put in questions for us. Uh, the other way is to do it by text through your phone. And you can text the word debakey to the telephone number 3760 seven and in a similar way you can text in your message and uh, we'll uh, try throughout the course of this evening to uh, respond to your questions and comments and complaints as well <laughs> so all right without further ado um, so my plan for this evening was for us to uh, go ahead and talk about uh, the different classifications of endoleaks uh, including uh, some of the newer classification system which involves both branched and fenestrated endographs. Uh, talk about uh, what the guidelines are from the SVS, the STS regarding uh, surveillance uh, post uh, abdominal and thoracic endographs, and then what are some of our imaging options? What are the limitations and uh, advantages of one um, modality over another uh, in the evaluation of endoleak? And then finally, we'll talk about the management uh, options, uh, which are quite various for all the different types of, of various endoleaks. And, and Marvin, before you go ahead, I would say that we see this more and more now as the, as the endografts have become established part of care for aortic aneurysm. Isn't that so? Correct. Because about 30 years ago, endoleaks were nowhere to be found. And now we see a lot more, a lot more finesse in treating them, a lot more finesse in diagnosing them. Especially as we've now uh, begun with branched and fenestrated mm -hmm. endografts, uh, it becomes much more complex, uh, the management of some of these leaks. Right. So uh, best way to do it is always start off with definitions. So uh, some of the new guidelines uh, want us to use a common language when we're talking about endoleaks. So uh, the first one is primary endoleak. So the definition of that is uh, an endoleak that's present on the initial completion angiography uh, at the time of graft implant or at the first cross-sectional imaging evaluation using either CTA or MRA. So that's a primary endoleak. A secondary endoleak is defined as a detection of a new endoleak uh, either by CTA or other imaging study after the original procedure and after the first follow-up CTA or MRA uh, procedure. And then a recurrent endoleak is one that you see a re reappearance of an endoleak uh, after you've been documented to have spontaneous resolution uh, or you've intervened in what you thought was successful intervention of an endoleak. Uh, definitely these recurrent endoleaks are thought to have a much more aggressive nature and posture and, and again something that you need to aggressively treat. So let's talk about the different types of uh, endoleaks. So the, the first type, uh, as you can see there, uh, this is kind of the classic uh, endograft uh, endoleak classification system, one through five. So type one is uh, present uh, or persistent filling of the aneurysm sac due to incomplete seal uh, and or inefficient uh, or ineffective seal at the proximal defined as type 1A or at the distal end type 1B uh, end of the endograft and we'll go into what 1C is in just a minute mm -hmm. when we start talking about the branch and fenestrated uh, endografts. A type 2 endoleak is a branch vessel uh, meaning that you have persistent filling of the aneurysm sac due to retrograde branch flow uh, from uh, collateral vessels so in the abdominal aorta that can be from the lumbar arteries that can be from the inferior mesenteric artery, uh, or in the thoracic aorta, it can be from the intercostals, the bronchial arteries, uh, or some of the brachiocephalic vessels if you've had to cover those. Most commonly would be in the subclavian artery. Uh, 
A type 3 endo leak uh, means blood flow goes into the aneurysm sac uh, due to an inadequate or ineffective sealing of overlapping uh, graft jo joints. Uh, so if you have two limbs, uh, if they become disconnected or if there's minimal overlap between them or severe angulation, you can get leakage between the two pieces or if you have a hole in the graft fabric, which fortunately mm -hmm. is pretty rare for us to see that these days, but with some of the older endografts, yeah. uh, that, that was a more of a concern. Uh, type 4 endoleak uh, means blood flow into the aneurysm sac uh, due to porosity of the graft. Uh, causing blood to pass through the fabric, so there's not really a leak at the suture line uh, or at the proximal or distal fixation. We're talking about uh, basically porosity through uh, the graft. Most of the time that's seen at the time of endograft implantation, depending upon how porous the graft fabric is, and usually that resolves once you reverse heparin with protamine. Uh, fortunately, with some of the, the different uh, graft fabrics that we have today, that is much, much, much less seen. Yeah. Uh, but early on in the endograft experience uh, that was a much more of a common problem. And then the last one is kind of the, the black box of, of type 5 endoleak or endotension uh, where you don't see an endoleak on any type of imaging modality but you see that the graft, uh, the, that the aneurysm sac is growing still. Uh, in those situations, it could be an endoleak that you haven't uh, imaged, uh, or uh, it can be from uh, essentially filtration of serum or different types of proteins across the grass, uh, graft fabric. And if you were to open up one of these aneurysm sacs, you would find this clear yellow type of mm -hmm. fluid. And uh, again, uh, with improvements of these endoleaks, it, it's pr improvements of the grafts and the fabric. It's really, really rare for us to see those these days. Have you, have you seen any of those or been involved? In that. I'll be honest, the type 4 and 5, mm. I've only seen one <laughs> so far, and that was somebody who had a graft, just like you said, an old generation graft <clears throat> with a different fabric which is not as refined and not as tested as it, as it is now. But the commonest that I've seen, which is the norm, is the type 2 endoleaks. The type sure. 1s are usually what we see during the procedure itself, we try and treat them. And then the type threes are rare, which have come from old devices, which have now slowly moved away from each other, and then they come in. So, but gotcha. I agree, type four and five. I have not seen a five. I've seen one four. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the endograph tension that I've seen, we've relined a couple of those graphs years and years and years ago, and they subsequently went away, and we thought, you know, likely it was a graph porosity problem, but we just really don't see that these days, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good problem. All right, so let's move on to the, the next type of endoleak classification, and this is uh, uh, new from the Society of Vascular Surgeons uh, with some of their reporting standards regarding uh, branched and fenestrated endografts. Uh, Dr. Uh, Oderich uh, chaired this committee and, and put this presentation together and uh, this paper together, uh, looking at a further uh, classification of endoleaks, uh, including uh, branched and fenestrated grafts. And so the ad uh, addition uh, in this setting was would be a 1C uh, endograft leak. And in that situation, it's the distal branched endograft uh, is not sealed in its attachment target vessel. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a 1C. A 3C uh, was, would be where either the aortic side branch uh, attaching to the aortic endograft or a side branch side branch overlap uh, is leaking between those two. And, th and the rest of the uh, endoleak classification is relatively the same. All right, so uh, let's talk about some of the different uh, imaging. What is your kind of go-to uh, post-endograft imaging uh, modality that you uh, feel most comfortable with that you routinely get in most patients? So routinely I start off with a CT angiogram, which is a specific, just for the ones who do not know the details, it's a CT scan with a specialized protocol with slightly higher amount of contrast and much finer cuts or slices, slice thickness that a normal CT scan would have. And that gives us a lot of information about a, mini a millimeter to millimeter uh, approximation of the graft if there are problems with the flow in the vessels above and below or in side branches with fenestrated grafts <coughs> and so on. So the first thing I try and do is a CT angiogram. Subsequently, at, this is at one month, and then at six months, I bring them back, I try and do a CT angiogram and an abdominal ultrasound. If there are no concerns for endoleak at the one month and six month, then I'd give up on CT scan and I go to ultrasound to follow these because it's cheaper, it's no radiation. And if, if there is any discrepancy in the readings, then I stick with CT angiogram. But otherwise, then go forward with ultrasound after that. 
Gotcha. Um, so <coughs> the typical what uh, most people order is kind of a post andrograph study, uh, and in that uh, CT imaging it includes a non-contrast uh, image first, which I think is helpful uh, to kind of delineate calcium out of the way. Uh, you can also get an aneurysm sac size from that. Uh, and then we typically will get an arterial phase study, uh, which kind of is a averaging of uh, the contrast bolus. Uh, it's a um, phase over several uh, you know, minutes or two when they get that arterial phase, and then they'll do a delayed phase, which usually uh, can be anywhere from you know, several minutes later, uh, two to five minutes later, when they get this delayed arterial phase. And so uh, that's the typical kind of endograft. Uh, there are some newer CT modalities and, and different uh, types of imaging that we can get from CT specifically uh, that we've used a lot here, uh, especially when you have a specific question to answer. And so for kind of our routine folks, I'm getting just your typical kind of post endograph study, but if there is evidence of an endo leak and we can't really see where that's coming from, there are some other imaging modalities. And uh, one of those is dynamic time resolve CTA or DCTA. Uh, and then there's also kind of an EKG gated one that we're typically using in the setting of, at least in cardiac surgery, uh, for TAVR to be able to get rid of cardiac motion as we're doing fine uh, measurements of the aortic annulus, the left ventricular outflow tract, and the ascending aorta. And so there's a couple different things that uh, I wanted to kind of bring out and discuss uh, when it comes to DCTA and mm -hmm. its utility. Um, and so DCTA, uh, or dynamic uh, time resolve CTA, essentially involves multiple CT scans acquired at different time points along the enhancement curve of the contrast injection. And so um, there is a higher radiation dose when you get this. You're taking multiple CT scans. You have a limited area that you can take a look at. So it's mm -hmm. not a, uh, like your typical post endograph study that you could get of the entire, you know, thoracoabdominal aorta if you wanted to. In this setting, you have kind of a limited area uh, and you're re-scanning it anywhere from 10 to 15 different times, different time points, uh, every five seconds or so uh, do, during that whole entire uh, contrast enhancement phase. And that allow you to go back then and take a look at those studies and you can trace uh, endo leaks uh, coming from. So if I have somebody who's got an endo leak and especially if I can't tell where it's coming from, uh, we've really found the, um, the dynamic time resolve CTA to be helpful. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I wholeheartedly agree. And I keep telling my patients, and for the for the viewers who are not used to doing this or seeing this, you know, we consider aortic sacs as uh, <coughs> we or endografts as pipe inside another pipe, and the outer pipe, which is the aorta, has multiple vessels going out of it. Once you put an endograft, those going out do not have the pressure to be pushed out. And so some of them start coming back into the sac. And that's what leads to these type 2 endo leaks. What Dr. Atkins was saying about looking at different time points, sometimes it happens that one vessel comes in at a certain time point and the contrast goes out through the other vessel. So therefore, it doesn't keep stagnating in the, uh, in the sac and therefore the sac doesn't grow. So we have endo leaks and we don't operate on them primarily because there is a way in and a way out. And when there are more ways in and less ways out, that's when these sacs start increasing. And the dynamic CT gives us a beautiful illustration of that time in and time out. Gotcha. One of the uh, newer things is this uh, dynamic uh, gated CTA, uh, which basically takes the patient, they have EKG leads on you basically based on their RR interval. Uh, and in a predefined cardiac phase, every 5 to 10% phases of the uh, systolic phase, uh, you can go ahead and you can actually get rid of motion as well. That's really not that important in the abdominal aorta, uh, but it definitely becomes important in the thoracic aorta and especially in the ascending aorta and aortic arch. And uh, we've got Got some studies going on here of looking at that in the ascending aorta for some of our um, uh, stent graft uh, patients that uh, involve the ascending aorta and it's been uh, really useful and helpful so far so I think you'll see down the road there'll be more uh, use of TAVR equivalent kind of uh, cardiac gated CTAs to get rid of motion in the uh, uh, thoracic aorta mm -hmm. uh, but less so important in the uh, abdominal aorta. I've got a couple examples uh, to show uh, here uh, this was a uh, paper uh, uh, looking at uh, dynamic CTA uh, for endo leak detection. Uh, this was uh, recently in the American Heart Association Journal. 
uh, and they've got some great pictures here. And so basically they uh, had a uh, routine post endograph study here that you can see in the 3D reconstructions. And uh, essentially this patient had kind of a large endoleak and they couldn't really tell where it was coming from, whether it was coming from, uh, you see some posterior enhancement of the aneurysm sac, you could say, well, it's probably a lumbar. Uh, you can't really trace it up to the IMA, but it's such a large cavity. Could in, be between limbs and basically you can't really tell uh, based upon that one kind of arterial phase of things uh, or the one delayed phase of where the endoleak is coming from. And so they went back, uh, they repeated the CT scan now with a dynamic uh, component to it and taking uh, shots every five seconds or so, uh, repeat scans. And so in this setting, what they were able to see in this patient was that uh, uh, through the right hypogastric artery, there was a branch you can see in the far left uh, screen there, it starts mm -hmm. to fill. Uh, and then five seconds later, you see kind of the middle portion of that vessel filling, and you can see maybe a little bit of the aneurysm sac. And then five seconds later, again, you can now see the aneurysm sac filling. And so they were actually able to uh, discern what this large endoleak cavity was coming from. And it was actually a branch off the hypogastric artery which you, you know, probably would not have thought that that would be the case, that with such a large endoleak, it may have been from a limb uh, uh, or uh, from the IMA or, or just a really huge endoleak. So in the absence of this, yeah. normally, this patient would have had an open operation, right? Either an open operation or you could have taken the patient in the operating room and you would have done multiple kind of contrast uh, injections, uh, aortograms, uh, shot various vessels uh, to kind of rule out a type 1 endoleak, uh, shot each iliac limb, uh, different ways and you know the patient would have gotten a lot of contrast to try and figure this out but it's always best if you can figure that out before you get to the operating room uh, which I think they were able to do here and here was their kind of final picture they actually went back and uh, went into that right hypogastric artery and they were able to uh, get into this brand special, uh, do a contrast arteriogram, demonstrate that it filled the aneurysm sac and they were able to coil it and uh, subsequently uh, took care of the endoleak. And so when people ask me about radiation doses during a dynamic CT, I always say exactly what you said is without that, we would then go to the operating room, do an on-table, say some people have the capability of doing on-table CT scans multiple views, multiple radiation exposures DSA, to the patient, yeah. to the clinicians involved. And so I think dynamic CT gives a tremendous advantage of, although there is some more radiation than conventional CT, there's definitely an advantage of not giving the radiation the patient and everybody else concerned. Right. The contrast injection used in the dynamic CTAs is really not that much more right. uh, than what's used during a conventional, so somewhere between 50 to 150 cc's mm -hmm. of uh, contrast. So uh, you really it's the radiation exposure, I guess, that's mm -hmm. a, the risk, and again, having to repeat another study, but somehow you've got to figure out where the leak is coming from. All right, next way of kind of figuring out some of these leaks is MRA. Uh, what's been your experience uh, using MRA in the, the situation of post endograph follow-up? I've had limited experience, to be honest with you. I have not used a lot, but I have used dynamic <coughs> MR on a patient who had an endograph of uh, uh, a, a, not a regular vendor that we use, and <coughs> there was a question about the apposition of the graph to the aortic wall. And everyone kept saying it's a type 1 endoleak, but it wasn't. It was actually a small, maybe a lumbar artery coming from the aorta really high where the endograph was sitting and was actually bleeding back into the uh, into the sac. So there, my the reason to do an MR was we just couldn't, because there was so much of metal there. Uh, it was a ovation graph with, a, with huge prongs going above for super fixation, renal, yeah. super renal fixation. And so with that much of scatter, we just couldn't see that branch. And the dynamic MR took out the calcium or we didn't see the calcium we we saw the stent void but we saw the contrast coming in gotcha so uh, at least my utility that I found is uh, for MRA has really been in kind of dissections, looking at uh, uh, false lumen filling and directional mm -hmm. flow and looking for uh, fenestrations up and down whenever you've got a uh, post TVAR uh, with a continued leak. Uh, so I've used it in that setting. I haven't really used it as much in the abdominal aorta. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, definitely some people do it. I think it's very institution specific. Um, and it's also very graph specific. So right. a couple things here that uh, I put is that, um, you know, MRA, again, typically uses gadolinium as the contrast agent. Uh, that's contraindicated in patients that have advanced uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, Ferrahem, which is another uh, non- 
um, uh, gadolinium-based uh, fer ferromoxtol is the other name of that, and that's a, a blood pool uh, iron oxide core encapsulated in a um, uh, semi-synthetic carbohydrate that you can use also as imaging. There's some uh, studies that people have, have used this in the setting of looking at endo leaks using ferroheme. Uh, we use that more frequently in the uh, thoracoabdominal aorta, mm -hmm. looking at uh, dissections and etc. Um, the problem with MR is that it's really graft specific, so it's okay to use in the setting of nitinol. But if you have, a, you know, for instance, a Cook graft or uh, another graft that uses stainless steel, mm -hmm. you can't use uh, MR uh, imaging. Uh, you know, um, in those situations, you would have to use some other type of uh, imaging modality, especially if the patient has chronic kidney disease disease. Uh, patients also can't be claustrophobic if you're worried about uh, using uh, MR, uh, and they cannot have any other ferromagnetic devices, a pacemaker, spinal nerve stimulator, uh, some other type of metal in their body that would uh, contraindicate the use of MR. Um, MR also is similar to uh, contrast uh, dynamic CTA, where you can attain multiple acquisitions following contrast media injection. Uh, again, the benefit of this uh, in MR setting is that uh, you're not giving patients radiation. So mm -hmm. that is the one advantage of MR. Um, it's not as far along uh, as uh, the imaging quality as CTA, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people are starting to use this, especially in patients that have chronic kidney disease yes. and uh, folks that you don't want to give. Uh, MR. There's some non-contrast injection MR studies that you can get a reasonable image. Uh, that's another thing, or non-contrast CT is another way to do that as well. Uh, it's very sensitive and specific for endoleaks, uh, but again, it's very institution specific. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a couple uh, images of just, uh, here's an endo leak on a non-con CT, can't really see real well, but then uh, here it is in the setting of um, uh, an MR study. So this is with gadolinium. Mm -hmm. Another option is contrast-enhanced uh, ultrasound for detection of endoleaks. Um, and so uh, do you frequently use the contrast-enhanced ultrasound, or are you just getting plain duplex ultrasound when you're no. looking for endoleaks? <clears throat> no, we have not used contrast-enhanced ultrasounds all the time. Uh, maybe a specific case, but not routinely and they just look for flow in the sac, but the contrast ultrasound does act, I mean, as is a wonderful tool to know if there's an endo leak or not. I don't, the, I think the limitation is the specificity of where the endo leak is, right. uh, or what or vessel is feeding it, but to diagnose difficult endo leaks, just to know if there is one or not, <coughs> I think in a contrast and right. an ultrasound would, would help. So I've used that uh, in combination with a non-con <coughs> CT scan of the admin, so you can get direct uh, aneurysm measurements, but then mm -hmm. using C uh, using ultrasound with contrast uh, enhancement, especially if you see that the sac is growing and you can't really tell on duplex. Uh, here's a couple examples there. You can see where uh, you they were able to kind of at least see where the endoleak cavities were, but again, as you alluded to, you can't really tell uh, definitely where those vessels are coming from couple other imaging studies here again where they've got uh, duplex is showing you flow in the limbs you don't really see anything in the aneurysm sac but then contrast enhanced <coughs> over here you can see uh, a couple of um, uh, areas where there's endoleak cavity posteriorly so before we proceed I would like to remind our viewers to uh, you know free free to ask us questions uh, just submit your questions to us by on the pollev.com and then enter Debakey uh, and please join us there or then text uh, the number is 37607 in the message box please text Debakey and then just send us a message you can interact with us with questions feel free to ask whatever questions you all have and either Char or I will make something up if we, we can't will, figure it out we will <laughs> optimally answer them <laughs> All right, so the next thing I was going to go to is just kind of some just general practice guidelines. Again, the audience is uh, uh, surgeons, but it's also residents, it's also medical students. Uh, so I kind of wanted to go over just some basic uh, guidelines or what some of the um, uh, recommendations are in terms of uh, endoleak management. Um, so obviously if a patient has a type 1 endo leak like we talked about either at the top end or the bottom end, uh, you got to do something about that. Mm -hmm. You can't leave that patient with uh, the endo leak. They've obviously got uh, direct arterial pressure and flow into the aneurysm sac and that's just a recipe for disaster if you leave that alone. So type 1 endo leaks you got to do something about. Um, 
in the setting of a type 2 endo leak, the only time that we're uh, doing something about it is if the aneurysm sac is expanding. And so what's your kind of threshold for aneurysm sac expansion over what type of time period would, would prompt you to do something further with a type 2 endo leak? But I think is the recommendation now 0.5 per year? Is that correct now? I think that's right. Five millimeters in a year period of time. If you can definitely side by side <coughs> similar imaging modalities, you can put those together and demonstrate that they are increasing in size. You probably ought to do something about that type two endo leak. You know, I, patients always ask me, why is it called a leak? And Dr. Lumsden, our chairman, he says it's the worst terminology <laughs> that we have created in endovascular surgery is a leak. He said it's hard to convince patients that it's not leaking. There's nothing leaking right. outside your body or in, outside your aorta. It's all confined. But, uh, of course, this, this term has stayed. But, gotcha. uh, yeah, we, we don't take all leaks to the OR all the time, for sure. Right. So a type 2 endo leak with an aneurysm sac not expanding, the guidelines are obviously just to mm -hmm. continue to watch that. In those situations, if you see that there is a type 2 endo leak, uh, in those settings, you'll continue to watch that patient up more frequently and have a lower threshold for getting CT imaging on those patients. Um, you know, again, it kind of depends upon the patient, their age, their kidney mm -hmm. function. Um, I'm less inclined to just move to ultrasound alone for those patients and, you know, I will more frequently get some type of uh, CT-based imaging, even if it's a non-contrast CT to see if the anger some sac is growing in size. So if I see that there's a persistent endo leak, I'm a little prone to watch them a little bit closer. And rightly so, because we've seen that somebody with a, say, a type 2 endo leak who has been managed non-operatively, as we say, and followed up, a few years later, they start showing size, increase in size of the sac. So right. it's not totally benign. And you're right, we should be a little more vigilant in following them uh, closely yeah. with proper imaging. Yeah, and not infrequently you'll have a patient that comes in with a rupture or symptomatic aneurysm contained rupture, uh, and you'll go back and look at their imaging, and they had a type 2 endo leak mm -hmm. at some point in time, mm -hmm. were watched, and then maybe this type 2 endo leak, some people believe, can convert over to loss of proximal seal, and now they've got a type 1 endo leak yes. and, and present with rupture. And so, uh, you know, definitely uh, type 2 endo leaks in the setting of an aneurysm sac growing are not a benign mm -hmm. phenomenon. All right, so type three endo leaks. Again, we talked about that that was either a hole in the fabric or disconnection of the limbs. Again, you gotta do something about it, direct arterial flow and pressure going into the aneurysm sac. Uh, type four, uh, like we talked about graft porosity, uh, the general recommendations are, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> just uh, reverse your uh, heparin with protamine at the end of the case, and the vast majority of these patients are gonna seal uh, things up over time. Um, if the patient has an endo leak that persists despite intervention, what are your thoughts? What do you do? Say a prayer first, number yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> well, persistent endo leaks are actually really bothersome because they're the most ungratifying cases to do. Because right. we, tr we do all we can. We try to wear in different vessels, different angles, different radiation exposures, but we don't get satisfaction. So. Um, there is a threshold about if this, if multiple interventions and the sac keeps on expanding, then I have a threshold to say, okay, then we have to uh, go to the uh, go to an alternative intervention, either open surgical repair or replacement or whatever it may be. Gotcha. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so again, I think it kind of again depends upon the patient, uh, how old, how frail they are. Um, you know what they can tolerate, but again, uh, you know, typically you're going to continue to do something definitive to mm -hmm. try and fix their repair. Sometimes you have to come up with some uh, crazy ways to fix that, and we can talk about uh, that here in just a bit. Uh, some of the different uh, uh, alternative options for management of type two endo leaks, short of opening the patient mm -hmm. up and uh, explanting the graft and, and completing an open procedure. There's some kind of hybrid things you can do, uh, and we'll talk about all the, uh, the different management strategies here in a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, if, let's move on to the next slide here. So um, what are our, or what are the SVS guidelines uh, published recently in the January 28th, uh, 18 edition of the JVS? Uh, what are the surveillance guidelines? And I think you alluded to this earlier. So uh, initial CTA and uh, duplex ultrasound at one month. Uh, if you see no endo leak, then you can get either a CTA or a duplex ultrasound at a year. 
Uh, if you see a type 2 endo leak uh, in those patients, you'll get a repeat CT or duplex uh, at six months. Uh, if there's no endo leak or sac enlargement at a year, then you can move to ultrasound, and that's been uh, validated, uh, and that's typically what we do these days. Um, you know, most of the endograft trials mandated CT imaging for at least a minimum of five years. Mm -hmm. Most of that, so uh, previously that was kind of everybody's. Uh, uh, typical uh, management strategy for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms was kind of yearly CT for many years, uh, but there is a risk to the patient, uh, right. mostly the contrast, uh, less so I guess the risk of radiation, but especially in patients whose kidney function is not great, uh, the sooner that you can move to ultrasound, the better mm -hmm. uh, for those patients. Um, if they have a type 2 endo leak, but either the sac is shrinking in size or it's stable, uh, the guidelines are duplex ultrasound every six months for the first couple years, uh, and then you can move to annually thereafter. So there are some nuances of whether you have an endo leak or not and whether the sac's uh, decreasing in size or if it's stable. Um, if you see a new endo leak, uh, especially they previously had imaging either CT or contrast enhanced ultrasound or MR that there was no evidence of endo leak and now they've got an endo leak, uh, you got to really investigate that and, mm -hmm. and just not write it off to a type 2 endo leak. You really have to make sure that that patient doesn't have a type 1 or a type 3 endo leak. And so in those patients, I'll typically go back and I'll pull their old CT scans. I'll look at the graft and see migration of the graft. Has it come down some? Uh, a lot of these grafts will migrate laterally, especially in big aneurysms. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that the seal that you had at the time of original graft implant is not the seal uh, zones that you have now, whether it's right. you know between the limbs or at the proximal or distal end. Um, so I'll definitely kind of compare over time uh, what's happened mechanically to the stent graft. Has it moved? Uh, and that also can, can clue you into whether it's a type 1 or a type 3 endo leak mm -hmm. in these settings. Um, the last recommendation there is that non-contrast CT imaging of the entire aorta at five-year intervals, uh, whether the patient's had either open or endovascular aneurysm repair. And I think, you know, historically we've not been great about, uh, especially in open aneurysm repair, uh, following up those patients long term because there are problems that happen after open repair. Uh, patients get hernias, patients uh, develop pseudoaneurysms at the mm -hmm. anastomoses, uh, they go on to develop uh, degeneration of their uh, visceral segment uh, of their th thoracic aorta so you know definitely uh, further imaging in the long term uh, these are our patients for lives and uh, you know we have to continue to follow them uh, uh, thereafter I agree because I also make sure that anybody who comes to me with a CT scan of uh, <coughs> say abdominal aortic aneurysm I always look for one CT scan which has their entire aorta <laughs> the baseline because you have to know if they have anything in the ascending, anything in the arch, anything in the descending before we start going after the abdominal aortic. Right. And just like you said, after a few years of following them for uh, intervention for the infrarenal or the abdominal, then uh, we make it a point to make sure the entire thing is imaged at least once. Right. All right. So let's start going into specific types of endo leaks and kind of their management. So type 1A endo leak, uh, again, that's a proximal seal zone problem. Uh, that can, you know, obviously it kind of depends upon the patient's anatomy to begin with, but in some series it can be upwards of 5 to 6% of patients. Uh, that at the time of implantation you have problems. You have a leak there due to either mural thrombus, calcification, angulated neck, a uh, neck that's tapered, or uh, if planning wise uh, you had a problem and you either have an excessively oversized or undersized uh, endograft, and those are kind of hard problems to fix. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's your kind of a initial management of somebody, you're in the operating room, uh, you shoot your, you're giving high fives to everyone and now you're about to shoot your final arteriogram and you see you've got a, a proximal endo leak at the top end there. Well, I must confess, I don't give a high five before I see the final, <laughs> <laughs> but once, uh, once I see a type 1 endo leak, uh, my first, my first um, you know, thing to do is to balloon it again. That's right. typically what I do, unless there is an obvious sign that I've we've deployed too low or not. Right. Second thing would be like you have put up there extension with a cuff. A cuff essentially would be about four and a half centimeters of a covered stent, which we could just land. I said never say just, but if we could land really close to say suppose this is an infrarenal endograph, we right? We go just close to the 
as close to the renals as possible, so overlap right. a little bit. Right. If that doesn't help, then look for something on the lower end. Is there something we're missing there? So we image the whole endograph above and below. And then at the type, uh, if at the proximal, the PAMA stent, I have not used it, but definitely in the repertoire, it just basically smashes the uh, endograph against the walls higher up with being open so that the renal arteries can still fill, SMA can still fill. Right. And um, I've tried endo stapling a few times. Uh, you're talking about endo anchors, right? Mm -hmm. For that. So uh, Hazim Safi next door calls it Tabasco sauce. So essentially, you're just <laughs> applying a little bit of spice in that. We don't know whether it works, but it has shown to have sure. some better apposition of the endograft. Okay. Okay. So, um, so these are the ones I've, I've tried. Gotcha. I've not had to open a patient and do a uh, do an open repair because of failure of the endograft. Right. So from initial on one, unless they're ruptured or something yes, like that. Yes, correct. And, okay. Um, so those are the kind of initial things uh, that we discussed there. So again, angioplasty with a compliant balloon extension, uh, as you mentioned, with another cuff, palmas, and we'll show some pictures of that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the endo anchor uh, options that are out there. Uh, and then again, if the patient's ruptured, uh, you know, you're going to have to seal that. You can't leave that alone uh, in those settings. Uh, that would be kind of the one time I can think that you would be um, uh, planning on uh, explanting that patient and fixing them open right then and there. Uh, or if you had some crazy uh, uncorrectable device uh, maldeployment, so you deployed a limb when you thought you were in the gate, you weren't in the gate, um, you know, just some, some terrible thing that knock on wood, uh, we, we've never had to, mm -hmm. had to do. Um, there are some small uh, endo leaks that you may resolve with reversal of heparin and uh, come back and fight another day. Um, you know, does the patient have an option for a fenestrated device? I think uh, down the road we'll have uh, uh, some off-the-shelf options for that. Uh, you know, you, you can definitely place a uh, uh, proximal cuff and you can chimney the renal arteries if we're talking about an abdominal aorta. Uh, that's one option. Uh, you can externally band. I've done that twice. Uh, I don't know if you've had any experience with that. Mm -hmm. I've taken a zip tie around the abdominal aorta. Uh, kind of as one of these hybrid uh, uh, procedures. Um, and uh, I can talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. And then uh, embolization of an endoleak with coils and glue. And so uh, th there are lots of different types of options for uh, type 1A endoleak, but obviously that's the, the thing we worry the most about with endografting. The one exception where, uh, where you leave a type 1A endoleak <clears throat> for now is in cases of fenestrated aortic repairs, where it is acceptable that if you have a proper alignment, if you have a proper seal, if all your marks are aligned, all the fenestrations have been stented, and you balloon everything you can, and you still see a type 1, it still said it's okay to wait, right. and wait for the endograft to um, conform to the aorta, wait for the heparinization to occur, and then re-image them sure. in a one. That's the only one exception, but I agree, everything else we have to take care right then and there. Gotcha. Um, so this is kind of an older picture that I found of uh, Palma's placement. Um, this is an endograph that's uh, you know in somewhat of an angulated neck. They didn't get a great seal. Uh, you would reballoon this uh, one or two times, and if you still don't have a great seal, uh, one thing you can do is take a Palma's XL stent, and so those. Uh, come not packaged and so you would uh, or not mounted on a balloon so you would actually have to take that mm -hmm. uh, what I've done in the past with those is basically you dip it in just full strength contrast to make it kind of sticky uh, and then mount that on some type of uh, coated balloon reliant balloon uh, some type of large aortic balloon uh, mount crimper uh, the uh, uh, the old days of stenting uh, stents had to be mounted on a um, mounted on a balloon beforehand they weren't uh, uh, made beforehand and and so we actually had a crimper device at my previous institution, so we would crimp these palmazes on uh, if you had to do that. And uh, again, uh, use a Reliant or a uh, Coda balloon uh, that has that. And uh, basically, you just put it across the neck and then balloon that up and see if it can remold and shape that endograft and hopefully push it over and conform. Um, there are risks with that. Uh, it's a balloon expandable stent you're putting across this uh, aortic neck, and you can you know definitely cause problems of rupture especially in an angulated or calcified neck, especially if that's the, the cause of the, the reason why you have a type 1A endo leak is if you've got a large area of calcium and a, mm -hmm. uh, something that's pushing the graft away and now you're trying to push against it in the opposite direction, uh, you know, there are risks. 
Um, so that's kind of a bail-out maneuver. Um, and when you do these balloon expandable crafts mounted off, you know, <coughs> back table and then you push it, is it critical to have a sheath all the way up there with the delivery and then pull the sheath back? Is it possible to do that every single time? Um, so usually when you have a reliant balloon uh, or a coat of balloon and you mount that pommage on it, th there's probably enough room around your sheath. I, I would try and get the sheath up as high as I can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you would worry about is that the the stent could come off onto the shaft of the balloon. Uh, if you were typical kind of, uh, if you had, an, I would definitely put it up the larger size, so 16 or 18 sheath that you have your main body going up, that's obviously the side that you would want to put that uh, balloon mounted palmas on, not the 11 mm -hmm. or 12 French contralateral side because you'd worry about it maybe shearing off and pulling back onto the, um, the shaft of the uh, uh, balloon and, and then you're kind of uh, in a tough situation there. There's not much you can do other than pull it back into the sheath, back the whole thing out, leave your wire, and then uh, hopefully not have it come off mm -hmm. uh, and make endo trash. That would not be good. Um, one option that's out there uh, is the endo anchors, uh, and I've got a couple cases of mine uh, that I, I'll show here in a bit uh, where I've found it useful. Uh, Aptus was the original name of the company, and then Medtronic purchased uh, the device. Uh, basically, it's a, a three millimeter uh, by three and a half millimeter endo anchor. Uh, that uh, screws out halfway and then you can either pull it back into the device or you can press the button forward and it'll completely deploy. Uh, it goes through the fabric into the aortic wall and can help push uh, and join the aortic wall and the graft fabric together. Uh, the cassette comes with about 10 uh, endo staples um, and usually you'll try and, and get the device perpendicular uh, to the, it has a little C marker that's on the end of the catheter there and you try and get that perpendicular to the aortic wall and then you, every 15 degrees you'll bring the C-arm around uh, and deploy another endo anchor. And so most of the time you end up with kind of six or more anchors uh, at the proximal end there if you're trying to, to seal things. Uh, I have a case of mine. This was an 86-year-old formal Naval Academy graduate, World War II veteran uh, that I saw that was still very active. He was caring for his elderly wife. Uh, uh, it was referred for kind of a seven centimeter uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm that was asymptomatic. Um, did not have much of a neck at all, and he was very concerned about uh, repair. Uh, I had uh, really thought that um, um, we should be able to find some type of uh, endovascular option. Uh, this was uh, uh, turned down for the Cook fenestrated device because he really had no neck whatsoever. And this is years ago, actually, when uh, the trial was coming out before uh, the Cook fenestrated device was approved. And so because he had no neck whatsoever below the uh, renal arteries, uh, they thought that um, you know he'd not be a great candidate for this. He had a conical reverse taper neck, so all the, all the reasons of the world to uh, not do well uh, with an endograft. Uh, and so we talked a little bit about uh, open repair, 86 years old, has to take care of his wife, not a, not a great option for open uh, versus uh, some type of endovascular repair. We talked about uh, chimneys and snorkels versus uh, trying to use endo staples. And so in this setting, I was uh, I used a Cook Zenith device uh, and landed it right on the money, right at the, uh, the renals and then subsequently went ahead and put endo anchors throughout the neck there. And you can see, I think I've got about six uh, endo anchors there, because what I was really worried about, especially with that reverse taper, that over time, the although we may get a seal, uh, there's not a lot of aorta for that graft to hold mm -hmm. on to. Uh, we've got a suprarenally fixated graft. Hopefully that would help uh, uh, distal migration, but by using these endo anchors, you really um, uh, literally put the graft in there just as you would with the uh, surgical sutures. And so this was our kind of completion picture here with a Very good nice. seal, no endo leak. Um, I do have a one-year CT scan that unfortunately, uh, this is one of the slides where I couldn't get the images to play beforehand, but uh, I promise you, Scout's Honor, that uh, there was no uh, endo leak uh, seen at one year, and he, he did really well. Uh, here's another patient uh, uh, that had a, the one we weren't initially planning on using endo anchors, and so she had uh, a 5.2 centimeter aneurysm, uh, reverse tapical neck, uh, 
uh, and we were somewhat surprised that we had a 1A endo leak at our uh, completion uh, angiogram. In this setting, I, I went ahead and I uh, ballooned it, uh, continued to have an endo leak, and so in this setting, I went ahead and I put anchors along that entire uh, lateral wall there. Uh, as you can see, we used a bunch of them, uh, almost the whole cassette. Uh, and we were able to uh, get this endo leak to resolve there uh, on the, the picture next to it. Yeah, it looks so scary that those things are going outside the aorta. Somebody asked me, do they go into the duodenum or the renal vein? And no, they don't <laughs> because right. they are not that thick to be going across the aorta through the adventitia. They probably just tend the adventitia a little bit. Right, so they're three and a half millimeters in length and so between going <coughs> through the fabric, any thrombus, uh, all the different layers of the aortic wall and the adventitia, uh, it probably yeah. just reaches uh, there. If it, it, there have been some explants where you can look at those and you can see the screws through the aortic wall on uh, some pictures I've seen, so it, it gets pretty close. But I have not heard of those screws right. specifically uh, going into the duodenum or other important structures. Um, have you had any experience with either laparoscopic or robotic IMA or lumbar ligation? I've only done one. Uh, Inframesentric artery ligation, uh, laparoscopic assisted, which but the assistance was mainly just to dissect it down, make a small laparotomy, and get down to it. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> but um, on my own, no. But from a personal standpoint, I'm interested in doing robotic vascular surgery, so I'm hoping we can take robotic technology with a laparoscope into the belly to treat these. If we could go even as back as to the lumbar arteries and right. the IMA would be just sitting there for us to see. Yeah, so the IMA I think is a, an ideal target. There's a lot of experience with our colorectal surgery mm -hmm. colleagues uh, treating patients with uh, rectal cancer uh, that they're going to take out, uh, you know, significant portions of their colon, sigmoid, etc. Yeah. Uh, that they routinely take the IMA, mm -hmm. um, and you know they take the IMV as well. But so in this setting, all you really need to do, as uh, suggested there on that picture on the uh, uh, the left hand side, uh, they're going ahead and they're clipping the uh, IMA. So that's something that's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the lumbar arteries are much harder, uh, especially if you're coming in from a abdominal approach, uh, transperitoneal approach. Uh, it would uh, be retroperitoneal actually. Yeah, it has so, to be. It has yeah. to be retroperitoneal. So if, you know, going in there transperitoneal, it's kind of, you got this huge aneurysm riding your way. Right. Uh, you really need to get <clears> on the backside. So in that setting, uh, you know, just like the, uh, nephrolo uh, the um, urologists that are doing laparoscopic nephrectomy, uh, laparoscopic, um, uh, retroperitoneal adrenals, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to be in the retroperitoneum, and, and there has been experience with there. So, you know, both of these approaches have uh, not really caught on in the vascular community. Again, uh, many of us don't use uh, our laparoscopic and uh, even robotic skills uh, uh, these days. And so, uh, you know, sometimes you would get one of your colleagues to help you, or uh, you know, uh, both of us have some interest. In uh, robotic stuff, and uh, maybe it's that's something that uh, we mm -hmm. should consider yeah. further in the future. All right, 1B endo leak. Uh, so now we're talking, we talked about the front end, now let's talk about the bottom end of things. Um, so again, I think it really kind of depends upon your planning and uh, where you were landing. Um, the initial management uh, obviously should be balloon angioplasty, see if you get a seal that way. Um, if you're still having problems, you may have to extend the graft. Uh, really, if your uh, treatment plan was landing kind of not in great aorta, trying to save the hypogastric artery, uh, landing in uh, thrombus or landing in aneurysm sac, um, you know, this is when you get into that trouble of a 1B endo leak. Uh, you can also see that uh, later on down the road when patients have maybe migration of the, uh, the aneurysm, if you didn't extend uh, the endo leak uh, far down. Uh, into the common iliac artery. Um, you know, these days I think most of us will try and take our endograft pieces and we'll extend it all the way down to the hypergastric origin. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, people would just try and do a two-piece graft and you'd land that thing just a little bit into the, you know, a couple centimeters, a couple three centimeters into the common iliac artery. As that graft migrates laterally, you can have where those limbs lift up and move out, uh, and you can get into trouble that way. And so, um, in this setting, uh, if you're landing not in great stuff to begin with, maybe you should have thought about a iliac branch device. Fortunately, we have that graft option these days. Um, 
Have you uh, done where you've done snorkels of the hypogastric and the external? Have you done that in this setting? To treat the type 1B or to treat the type 1B? I have not, no. I have not. So I, I've had one case I can, I can remember, uh, you know, never, never want to mention an end of one of essentially uh, coming from either up and over or coming through the arm, depending upon the length of the um, uh, shaft of the Vibon that you have, but essentially coming in down with one Vibon and up with one Vibon on the other, and then deploying it into the two limbs, and you end up with kind of two Ds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, next to each other within the limb there uh, and can get flow into both the hypogastric and the yeah. uh, external iliac in that setting. These days with iliac branch devices uh, and good planning beforehand, frequently we don't have that uh, problem. Right. Um, best to plan for problems beforehand. All right, type 2 endoleak. So uh, present at the time of the procedure in 25% of patients, uh, half of these will resolve by the one-month imaging study. Uh, in patients that have their one-month CT scan, uh, we see it in 10 to 20% of EVAR patients. Uh, factors that increase the risk uh, would be a patent IMA, uh, and we'll talk a, another study here that I've got to, to present here to you, see what your thoughts are about that. Uh, the number and diameter of patent lumbar arteries, especially at the L3, L4 level, middle sacral. Uh, and then if these patients are on uh, ongoing anticoagulation, that increases your risk of a type mm -hmm. 2 endoleak not resolving. Do you try and hold anticoagulation in these patients? Usually the anac I don't because usually the anticoagulation is for something really important like atrial right. fibrillation or stroke or history of DVT or PE. I or try valve, not yeah, to. Sure. Or valves, yeah, sorry. I'm not a cardiac guy, so I don't think about that first. Always so, no. remember the valves. <laughs> don't forget about the valves. Yeah, the, yeah but no, I have. I try not to unless there is absolutely no contraindication to. Gotcha. Uh, so we have various options uh, as listed there on the screen for patients that have a type 2 endoleak. Uh, we can embolize the IMA via the SMA and the arc of Riolan, and we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of that. Uh, if it's coming from the lumbar arteries, sometimes those come from the hypogastrics, and like we talked about with our imaging studies, you can sometimes trace it back from the hypogastrics. Uh, other options would be direct uh, either trans lumbar or trans cable puncture of the sac and basically getting into the cavity and filling it with either onyx glue or coils or mm -hmm. both. Uh, those are different options. Uh, the downside of that obviously is that it, uh, especially if you just put coils, uh, really leaves a lot of spray artifact, uh, makes the follow-up imaging, especially with CT, mm -hmm. much more difficult. Um, other options, you can uh, take a glide wire, glide catheter, and go underneath an iliac limb to get back into the aneurysm sac. Uh, that's another option. Uh, downside of that is that you may not have the same kind of torqueability and ability to get around, uh, but that is one option. Uh, usually when you pull everything out, the limb will expand. Many times I'll, I'll balloon that uh, to make sure that we've sealed whatever little channel that you created. Uh, and then we talked briefly again about uh, laparoscopic robotic assisted IMA or lumbar ligation. And then the last one is kind of open repair. Uh, and in that setting, uh, depending upon the patient and what their comorbidities are, whether they'll tolerate uh, graft explant, aortic cross clamping, uh, there have been a couple times where I just opened the aneurysm sac, uh, saw massive uh, middle sacral or lumbar mm -hmm. artery repairs, and just oversewed those, and then plicated the sac back over the endograft and, and did not have to explant the patient and, and those couple times I did that worked out pretty well. Have you done that? Yes, I have had two patients thankfully like you said they have had good seal above and below and we were but <clears throat> in those cases my practice is to get circumferential control of the aorta above the renals at right. the renals so just in case oh, the yeah. graft slips then we are not you know bathed in, in blood there but yes I, I agree with you if you have a good seal, you can clamp, open the sac, ligate whatever is bleeding with a stitch, and that becomes a definitive way of curing that. Gotcha. All right, so uh, we're getting the five minute mark here, so we got to speed up. So uh, one of those, uh, the arc of real land is essentially where you go into the SMA, either from below or above. A at least in my personal experience, I've had more success with it coming from above, from a brachial approach. I don't know what your experience has been. I mean, I recently had a case, uh, we, I presume we, have, we, don't, we may not have time for all that, but I, with, the, with the tour guide, Aptus tour guide sheath, right. or the tour guide sheath, which is you know steerable getting into the sma now is not a big issue the only issue is you cannot track the sheath through but gotcha. to get access into to put catheters and micro catheters in right. it becomes much easier 
Gotcha. Okay, so essentially going to the uh, SMA, uh, getting down to the middle colic artery, and that's that first branch off the middle colic artery is that arc of real land that you can see here. Uh, and basically you use a micro wire, micro catheter, track all the way around and coil embolize the origin of the IMA. Uh, here's an example of that. And people think it is hard to do so, but actually <coughs> it's not because the flow just takes you there. I think this is the case. This that is I, your case, yes, correct? Yeah. So here you are coming from below, getting into the SMA with a tour guide, and then you can see that first branch coming off there. And then that image was we we had image fusion and we we oh, superimposed the old CT on that too. Gotcha. That's awesome. And <clears throat> and we keep pushing catheter through and then we finally get to that branch and here it's interesting it looks like it's going from that IMA into the sac and then there is a <laughs> branch going down into the probably going to the hypogastric so we ended up coiling this I think the next one shows that the coils are in place and we don't see flow coming in from there but then we do see a little trickle coming from going from below hmm. and uh, <clears throat> to be sure this was not a persistent you know source at the end of the procedure, I injected both from the hypogastric and from the SMA. And I think the first one is through the hypogastric where it's taking some time, but uh, the first one through the hypogastric where it showed that the branch went up, but then did not go and <laughs> get into the branch that was coming to, uh, to the one going to the coils. Yeah, here's your hypogastric yeah. shot here. <clears throat> So you, you see those branches and then one faint branch goes up and then stops and then the, the next one was through the SMA again to confirm that there was no bleeding uh, going back gotcha. across the coiled artery. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then like we talked about earlier, we did a dynamic CT which was just gated to his abdominal aorta just at the side of the endoleak and that has showed that the endoleak, there is still a blush but it is much less in quantity than it was before and the sac sizes remain the same. So now I'm hoping with the next imaging we would, we would stay the same or decrease would be best. Gotcha. Um, here I have a, a randomized controlled trial that recently came out uh, in 2020. This was in the Annals of Surgery, uh, so you may not uh, necessarily um, mm -hmm. uh, have seen this one, uh, but it actually came up on the uh, Vascular Surgery Recertification Boards. It's listed as one of the uh, key references, so uh, for anybody taking their Vascular Surgery Boards, this came up. Uh, it was kind of interesting. So it was basically they looked at patients that were at high risk for type 2 endoleak, which they defined as a IMA greater than three millimeters, lumbar arteries greater than two millimeters, or if they had aortoiliac type of aneurysm. So both of the iliac arteries were involved as well. Uh, they randomized patients uh, to either embolization, no embolization of the IMA. They had a very high success rate. Uh, they, were, uh, they used an Amplatzer plug so that they wouldn't have the spray artifact with uh, coils. Uh, the follow-up though wasn't great, only 22 months, uh, they have a longer period that they're going to follow these patients. Uh, but what they did find that they had about half the rate of type 2 endoleaks. Uh, they found that the sac size significantly decreased much more in the embolization group, uh, as well as aneurysm sac growth, uh, even just over the two-year period, 3.8% versus 17%. Uh, they had no complications, uh, no re-interventions, but again, this is kind of an early to mid-term study. Uh, so we can talk about some of the different limits of this, uh, as you can see there on the screen, but um, you know, somewhat of a provocative study. Uh, and uh, you know, I remember in fellowship uh, that early on we were treating type two, or t uh, we were treating IMAs and coiling them mm -hmm. prior to <coughs> endografting patients, and then that's kind of really gone away. Uh, but there is some thought that maybe we should be, especially in larger ones. If you see a really big IMA, you also take a look at the uh, celiac and the SMA yeah. and make sure there's not a reason they have a really big IMA. Uh, but in the setting of a large IMA, uh, this study may suggest that uh, we ought to do something about that prophylactically. All right, type 3 endoleak. So again, you've got uh, either pieces falling apart from each other uh, or a hole in the fabric. Again, you're going to kind of reline them, uh, which you can see on the screen here. Uh, type 4 fabric porosity, again, usually resolves. Uh, no mm -hmm. treatment required. Don't worry about it, the SVS says. Uh, again, Lose some sleep, but then gain it back. <laughs> that's right. Type 5 endoleak or endotension, again, uh, no discernible uh, endoleak <coughs> seam, but the sac keeps getting bigger. Uh, again, the uh, options and really individualized uh, treatment uh, is necessary for these patients, sometimes relining, some rarely explanting and converting them to open repair.
Um, I know we just got a very brief period of time. I was just going to talk about some of the endoleaks of the thoracic aorta. Most of these that we see are from a type 1A or 1B endoleak, either due to poor proximal or distal seal. Uh, you know, especially in the setting of if you're trying to chimney uh, mm. brachiocephalic vessels and somebody that you don't want to do an open uh, debranching from, uh, very common. Up to a third of patients are going to have some 1A gutter leak uh, in those patients. Uh, there's lots of different options that we can talk about for fixing uh, a 1A or a 1B endo leak uh, to include chimneys, periscopes, uh, laser fenestration, uh, branch uh, head vessels, uh, all combined with endograft extension. Uh, so different options uh, in these settings, but uh, you know sometimes you have to explant these as well, uh, convert the patients to open or at least debranch the head vessels and bring the endograft much more proximally. Uh, the most common one you probably see too is also a type 2 endoleak from the subclavian artery. Most of the time if you're doing it electively, you're going to coil embolize the, uh, the subclavian, you're going to do a carotid subclavian bypass, uh, and not going to be an issue. Uh, it's pretty rare for us to see intercostals and bronchial arteries as the cause of an endoleak. Mm. It can happen, um, but I, I can't recall when I've had to retreat or had to treat an um, intercostal endoleak. Uh, have you had any experience in the thoracic aorta yeah, of having said, to do that? I said never say never, but I have never had one. And, uh, no. yeah. oh, Which okay. is really surprising because you think, you know, across that whole thoracic aorta, uh, you've got way more uh, vessels, uh, lumbar or intercostal arteries, compared to the lumbar arteries for an abdominal endograft, but we just don't see that. I think also the resistance of the outflow is also probably there because the right. intercostals are they quickly go and then become high resistance outflow vessels. Maybe that's why they don't have too much of inflow coming back. Gotcha. Compared to IMA or hypogastrics. And again, we talked about some of the options for fixing some of these uh, 1A <coughs> endoleak problems, parallel grafts where you're uh, just stent grafting the brachiocephalic vessels, putting an endograft there and hoping that it molds around, but this does uh, make gutters, which is not great. Uh, here's a couple examples of that. The more parallel grafts that you have, the higher the rate of gutters. Makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, uh, there's different uh, in situ things you could do if you had to extend the grafts around. You can take a laser or radio frequency and you can actually burn a hole in the graft and then you can put a covered stent graft through that. Uh, different options for patients. Uh, all of it off label, of course. Uh, you can use a uh, just a needle and poke a hole uh, in it and then uh, stent graft it uh, similar to, the, uh, to what we said about using the laser. Uh, you can back table modify grafts. This is one that I did, uh, back table modification, burning holes in graft with ophthalmologic cautery and then trying to put restraining ties to put it back into the, um, the sheath, which is really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> So lots of different options when it comes to the thoracic aorta and treating uh, some of these uh, complex uh, endoleaks. All right. Do we have any uh, questions, Tyree? Or we? I think we had no questions this evening. We answered everybody's thoughts. All right. Well, we'd like to thank everybody for your attention this evening. Charo, thank you so much for joining me uh, tonight to discuss endoleaks. And thank you, Mark. We'll see everyone on the uh, next CV Aortic Live.